Hello, and welcome to the channel. Um, thank you for following One Kev Griff. Um, I have no idea who people are um, in in the real world or what people's Twitter handles are. So, if you're someone who I know extremely well and have drunk beers with, and I just call you by your Twitter handle, then I apologise in advance. Um, so yes, welcome to my little Twitch stream of coding experiments. Um, if this is your first time watching this stream, what I have been doing is uh, trying to use YARP, which is stands for yet another reverse proxy. And it's a reverse proxy like Traffic or Nginx or something like that, but it's implemented in ASP.NET Core uh, 5.0. And you sit it and sit it in front of other services, and it just passes um, data through, passes requests through, and those get serviced. And I thought, I wonder if you could sit it in front of a web forms application, for example, and then intercept certain pages and rewrite those pages using ASP.NET Core um, MVC and use it as a way of gradually, sort of one page at a time, upgrading. Uh, a big complicated web forms application to ASP.NET Core to bring it up to date rather than just having to stop and down tools and everybody um, just doing nothing but rewriting a, a big web forms application in uh, over six months or something. And so far it's it's going quite well. Um, the general principle worked. You can definitely intercept pages. Um, so we have our um, our facade application here that we've created and this has got uh, just a standard controller um, and uh, we used the template here to pick up the the default route and that returns a view from the facade application which has been implemented using Razor and everything else and I copied all the styling and bootstrap and everything across from the web forms application and so when it sees a page that it knows, it intercepts it and it renders it using ASP.NET Core. And if it doesn't have a, an, an entry for a particular page, it just passes it straight on back through to the backend application. And the backend application in this instance is Wingtip Toys, which is a web forms sample application that I found on the internet. Um, I think C, C Sharp Fritz, Jeff Fritz, um, pointed me at it, which was very nice of him. He also obviously streams quite regularly if you're um, looking for other people to watch on Twitch then uh, C Sharp Fritz is definitely worth checking out. So if I run this application here um, and we go to our Google Chrome instance here and typical web forms application takes a, a chuff of a long time to spin up but here you go here we have wingtip toys and there's a shopping cart and everything else. And then if I go to my um, ASP.NET Core application, which I've got sitting in Rider, thanks for the follow, Guilek. Really appreciate it. Trying to get up to to 50 followers. That's that's the first target that Twitch give you. Is like, ah, oh, you need to have 50 followers, or or you're not a proper Twitch streamer or something. So all the follows very much appreciated. As is the T. I had a shower. I don't know if you if you tuned in last Thursday, you know my boiler broke. Um, and uh, yes, Wednesday night, all the power in the house went out because there was just a leak inside the boiler and it blew all the electrics. And so I've had to remove the boiler from the circuit in order to be able to have any other electrical things at all. And so six days with no hot water and no heat. So I've just had a shower and I'm feeling lovely and, and all ready for streaming. So yes, okay, here we go. We've got our facade application, and um, if I run this, and then that's spinning up and running, and then we can go in here and we can go to HTTPS localhost 5001, and you can see we've got uh, wingtip toys too, so you can tell that this is being served from the facade application, and we've got an admin link and a cart with zero products in it and so forth. And if I go into cars, so this is being served by the back-end application, um, the, the web forms application, and I can go, oh, I want a fast car and add that to my cart. And you see now we've got our cart with one thing in it, 
but the fun bit is that um, we we made this link through, so we're sharing session between the back-end web forms application and the front-end uh, ASP.NET Core application. The back-end actually takes care of session, and the front-end just talks to it and says, hello, I, I need to get a value out of your session. And we've implemented that directly in the code at the moment. Um, the eventual plan um, is to extract this this kind of clever stuff for sharing things between applications into NuGet packages and then stick them out there and say to people, hey, you can upgrade your web forms because it is my mission for 2021 and beyond to kill .NET 4, um, or at least to rescue people from .NET 4 like it was a burning building full of plague, um, <clears throat> which it, it isn't. It, it definitely isn't that. Um, so, sorry, Microsoft. <laughs> I didn't call your product that. Um, but yeah, so you'll see on here we have a, an admin page. And when you go to the admin page, it takes you to this account login. And there's a return URL and everything. Um, and if I want to go to the admin page, I have to um, go admin. And then the password here, um, I had to dig around in the... Um, code for the wingtip toys application but yes um, the username is admin and the password is p a double dollar word so if i go back to here and i put p a dollar dollar word and log in and then you can see here that i'm now into my administration page where i can add products and remove products and do all that good stuff and over here it's saying hello admin and log off. But if I go back to the home page, um, ah, it's it's redirected me across there. So if I go back to localhost 5001, it's not saying I'm logged in and it doesn't know that I'm logged in. I can navigate to the admin page, but um, I can't do anything else. And so what I want to look at today is how can I um, use the back-end application to authenticate the front-end application and you share the same sort of information between those two things as well, which is going to be fun. And actually, um, I saw a blog post today by um, Damien Bowden, um, and he is doing something similar in this blog post um, but using Yarp as an authenticating proxy in front of an older API. Um, so it's it can be difficult to uh, add um, modern authentication like um, Azure Active Directory or um, OAuth authentication or Open OIDC authentication. And so he's written this blog post here, and I will um, post a link to this into the chat. Um, if I can find my chat window, there we go. Um, there we are. Um, but yes, uh, so this blog post is looking at um, sticking Yarp in front of an API, doesn't mention what the backend API is written in, and then using Microsoft Identity.web to add um, Microsoft Identity Web API authentication, which is really nicely implemented in ASP.NET Core. So do the authentication in this YARP um, proxy and then pass calls back through and um, pass the tokens through on the proxied calls and uh, and everything else. So yes, that's another interesting use for YARP. And I think actually um, as, as people get to grips with it and, and once it gets out of preview, because it's still a preview package at the moment, I think we might see a lot more of these things. And I think this is going to be um, a really interesting way for people to um, start migrating their code over to ASP.NET Core. So um, I'm going to jump in. I, I have a vague notion. Um, <laughs> and uh, Again, if this is your first time watching the stream, this isn't prepared. I haven't got any slides. This isn't a, a, a conference talk. This is me. Um, hey, Steve Talks Code. Thanks for the follow. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this isn't a, a user group talk or, or anything which, as, as everybody knows, I prepare very, very um, rigorously for. This is me kind of faffing around and going, 
I wonder how things happen and you're learning stuff while I'm learning stuff and theoretically it's it's lots of fun. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a break point in here. So this is what's going to get called when we go to the admin page. Um, and if we go back to here and click on admin and I hit my break point and then um, I'm really... Did the page object, did it have you, let's go to locals, this, um, I think there's a user object in, in an ASP.NET web form. There is. Um, and it is a claims principle. And so, and that's got various claims in it and so forth. So what I'm going to want to do is what we did with the um, session code is we um, got the value out of session and we serialized it using message pack. Um, theoretically, message pack will let us serialize complicated objects. Um, there are limits. It doesn't like having objects with circular references and so forth. But um, that we serialized the thing across, and actually, it's just a string at the moment that's going. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we need to serialize that claims principle. And I do know this from my um, long experience with uh, .NET and .NET Core. Claims principles do not like being serialized. But we're going to do it anyway. Um, so let's drop into here and we'll just we'll stop this application running. And we have got our... Uh, we created an ASP.NET um, HTTP handler, this facade thing here, um, to intercept requests because it's a nice easy way to, um, you know, we don't need a lot of functionality for, for this. Um, and uh, we just want to serialize the thing and send it back over the HTTP connection. And um, it's also nice and easy to bundle up as a uh, as a NuGet package so that people can just drop it into their applications um, and use it there. So I think I'm going to create a, another handler um, and I'm going to call it um, public class um, auth API handler and we will implement IHTTP handler on there and implement the missing members and we'll do that. Um, and I think we can make this one reusable as well, which is generally good for performance. This should be thread safe. So with the HTTP handler, um, and uh, that's that's fine there. Um, <coughs> with the HTTP handler. Uh, you get the HTTP context gets passed in to the method, and so everything we need is on there. So we can reuse this class over and over again, which saves a bit of um, pressure on garbage collection and everything else. And so in here, we can say context.user. Um, and context.user is uh i principle so why is that an i principle i'm assuming that's going to be a claims principle um, so i should be able to say if context.user is claims principle principle um, because this type matching did actually make it into uh, does actually work in .NET 4.5 this wingtip toys application was a .NET 4.5 application when I found it I briefly tried to upgrade it to a .NET 4.7.2 application but it broke stuff and so I reverted it back again um, 
So that's what we're using. And we will just, in here, we'll say um, debug dot right line um, principle dot identity dot name just to have somewhere to set a breakpoint and then we need to hook this API handler up oh then we'll say um, res uh, context dot response dot status code equals 200 and context dot response dot end and probably context dot response dot flush because it seems to like it when you flush the response. Okay, um, and then we need to hook this up, which you do in web.config. And because web.config, it has to go into two places. So we have our HTTP handlers here. Um, and so we have our facade auth as the path for that. And we'll just change this to auth API handler, like so. And then we also had to put it into our um, system.webserver handlers. So this will be in here and we'll call this facade auth and change the path again to auth. And this is going to be changed to auth API handler. And now that should, in theory, be working. And so I can just hit that from here. And this is going back into 1404. And if I just go to facade auth and I hit my breakpoint, and I got my principle, and it is a, uh, a claims principle. It says it's a generic principle there, but it is a claims, and I've got my claims in there like that. So this is what I want, and now I need to figure out um, how to get this. And so principle, and if we drill down through here, um, we can see identity and is authenticated is set to false. Okay, so we can stop that and then in here we can say um, if principal.identity uh, could possibly be null is authenticated equals false cannot implicitly so yes we want the no it is definitely on there I want it um, then we can say context dot response dot status code equals 401 which means not authenticated and then we can Copy these two lines up here, move those across like that. So if we're not authenticated, um, then we'll just return not authenticated to whatever called us, and they can deal with that accordingly. Otherwise, we're going to do interesting things. And what we are doing is we are um, we're going to try and serialize this claims principle and put it across. Um, using message pack. So I'm going to create a uh, public class um, doo -doo -doo, uh, message principle. Let's just call it that. This is going to be our message pack um, class that we're going to use to send things across. Now in our session API handler, we use message pack serializer dot serialize, and there is a contact contract list standard resolver. So this will serialize any object at all. 
and at the other side you just try and recreate it as the right kind of object and it um, it should pass across okay. I'm going to come back and optimize this at some point in the future and go, you know, if it's just an int then let's just do the convert to bytes using bit converter for the simple built-in things. But for um, the auth API handler, you can't serialize. Hi Pete, thanks very much for the follow, appreciate it. Um, yeah, you can't serialize claims principle, and this goes back years. Um, it has always been broken, and the main reason you can't see, I think JSON.net can actually serialize a claims principle to JSON. Um, but even there, the problem is it's got circular references. So the identity has a bunch of claims, and the claims have a reference to the identities to say this is the identity that I am a claim for, and so forth. If we jump in and drill down a bit into this, um, again, <clears throat> and we go back to facade auth. And just let's set a breakpoint here so it actually hits it. Um, so yeah, here uh, we have our principle, which has an identity, um, and uh, our identity has some claims, and our claims is actually uh, not empty because it has something in here. Um, and then the subject of this claim is the identity up here that um, references it. And so it's really difficult to serialize these things because they have so many circular references. So I'm going to copy the claim across into a different class, and then I'm going to serialize that class using standard um, message pack stuff. So we are going to have... Um, public um, let's get the documentation for uh, claims principle up so claims principle here we go and this in its properties has identities um, which is an innumerable of claims identity. And a claims identity has uh, various properties, um, but one of those is claims, which is an I innumerable of claim. And so we're going to need classes for all of these. Um, so we are going to have a uh, public... Uh, message identity and we will have a public class message claim like so and then we're going to want to be able to create um, all of these in our message principle um, and so I uh, have no idea what I'm doing um, which is exactly as it should be. So I'm going to have a public list of message identity identities. And I'm going to have... Uh, if I want to create this from a claims principle, let's just we'll do a static method. Um, public static message principle from uh, claims principle. That's our source there. And so we can say um, source dot, we've got identity, we've got claims, and we've got identities like that. Um, so that's just the main identity. That's all the identities that we've got. So if we say for each 
in source.identities. Call that source identity. Resharper's much better at naming than I am. I do like uh, Resharper. And I like Rider as well. I'm basically using um, Visual Studio to work with the old source code and Rider to work with the new source code. Um, just so I don't get lost and forget which piece of, of source code I'm in, which I find is really helpful uh, when I'm working on these um, upgrade projects. Uh, keeps the two things clear. So in my source identity, um, I can say var message identity equals new uh, message identity like that. And then my source identity dot... So we've got an is authenticated, and we've got an actor, Lord knows what that is. We've got an authentication type, um, and we've got a bootstrap context and the claims label, string, name. So I'm going to create a new one. So var x equals new claims identity. And we've got uh, authentication type and name type and role type and a bunch of claims so enumerable um, so we want authentication type name type role type so we say authentication Type equals source identity dot authentication type and name type equals source identity dot uh, name claim type is that? Anyone has any idea what I'm doing, then do feel free to drop a message in the chat and help me out. This is a, a semi-interactive process. Um, but yeah, we we are figuring this out as we go, and it is lots and lots of fun. What on earth is a bootstrap context? Um, why would you have a bootstrap context? I don't know. Um, we can certainly set is authenticated equals source identity dot is authenticated. And then we can say x equals source identity dot and we'll put in label. Let's put label in there. And then we can put y equals source identity dot name claim type and z equals source identity dot role claim type. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. And then we can just change that to label and that to name claim type, and that to role claim type, like so. And then we can just use resharper to add these properties. The weird selection things that are happening are resharper fighting with VS Vim, because I have the VS Vim plugin installed in Visual Studio. Okay, so that is, this is a message pack serializable object and so I'm going to refer to the message pack documentation um, up here. So this is the message pack library that I'm using um, and quick start. So we have message pack object and then we put the keys on like that. So let's, we'll put message pack object and then uh, let's leave them in alphabetical order. It's as good as anything. So then we can say key zero and key one, let's grab those. Uh, 
and we'll call this key two and key three and key four. Um, so that's good. And Then we want to dump the claims in there as well. And so we can say for each uh, in source identity dot claims. We'll just call that source claim. And then we're going to say var uh, message claim equals new message claim x equals source claim dot right so we want all of these to go across um, so we want issuer and we'll call that issuer and then x equals source claim dot original issuer And x equals source claim dot. Uh, we won't do properties because um, we want that to. Oh no, we we'll do that as well. We can do a dictionary of string string. Is that string string or string object? String string. That should serialize. Okay. Y equals source claim dot. Uh, we don't want subject because we think subject is probably going to be the thing that we're serializing into. Um, so we want type, um, let's just set these properties and type like that, um, and then x is source claim dot uh, value, and y is source claim dot value type, like so. type and we can copy that up there let's move that into a different file and original issuer properties Type value and value type. And then we need to turn this into a message pack object as well. So that's a message pack object. And E zero grab two lines and then we want this to be keys like that. Okay, and then this is the fun bit because we want to be able to reset that um, that item in there. So I think if we have a list of identities and then we can reference the identity in its list so we can pass it across as like an array and then if we store the number that it is in the array then we can reconstruct it we can rehydrate it on the other side um, probably I don't know let's leave it simple for the time being um, and so our message identity here 
um, we will have a uh, key five and this is going to be a public list of message claim claims and we'll just stick this in here for the time being and we'll say claims equals new list message claim like so and then in here we will say message identity dot identity dot claims dot add message claim like so and let's put a setter on here and we'll say var um, message principle is a new message principle um, no, we won't do that Identities is a new list of message identity. And then in here we can say uh, message principle dot identities dot add message identity. Okay. And then we can just return that back out again. So now we have that. Um, oh, we want to do a return here as well, don't we? Um, This is not working well with null detection. So, um, yeah, in theory, this should be all we need and we should be able to reconstruct this on the other side. Um, I'm sure I've missed something and I'm sure somebody will point it out to me if I have. Um, but let's start with this. Um, so we say if it's a claims principle then we are going to say um, var message principle equals um, message principle dot from claims principle principle two too many words principle around the place one two three four four principles in one line of code that's fantastic and then we can say var bytes is message principle uh, message pack serializer dot serialize and we're just going to pass message principle in there and this of course needs um, mpo adding to it and then we'll just put key zero on here like that message claim we can move across somewhere else so we've got our bytes there and um, we can just say context dot response dot binary write bytes um, context dot response dot uh, and 
And then if it's not a claims principle down here, we'll just do this as a 401 again. Quick and dirty, just get it working. Okay. So if we run this now, and let's see what happens. So I'm going to log in, go here, admin, p a dollar dollar w r t, log in, and then go to facade auth, and yeah, that looks something like what I would be expecting to come out of there, or something I don't know. Does it? Um, let's just jump back to here. And we'll set a breakpoint here and refresh. There's our breakpoint. So our message principle um, has got uh, one identity, and our identity has got uh, authentication type application cookie. It's got four claims in there. It's got a name claim type. Um, and the claims, we've got a message claim. So these don't appear to have been serialized. Why have these not been serialized? Let's um, take a look in here. Uh, so we've got message identity claims add. That's in there. I don't know. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. That should be okay. Um, we got our claims are going across there. All right. Well, we can just. Uh, we should. Maybe we could write some tests. No, that's just crazy talk. Um, no, I might actually have to write some tests for this. So uh, let's add a new project to Wingtip Toys. And we're just going to create a .NET Framework class library. Um, you have to excuse me, I'm going to do this off screen because this <laughs> dialog box is too big. Uh, and let's drag this back down here like that. Um, and we're going to call this uh, wing tip tests. .NET Framework 4.5. Oh no, we'll use 4.7.2. And create that. And go into our NuGet packages. Install X unit. There we go. And we'll add a reference to Wingtip Toys, like so. And we'll call this message principle tests, like that. Okay, so let's just create a fact and public void, yeah, um, serializes and deserializes. So it's a var source equals new message. Uh, Principle new identities equals new list of identities. Um, 
void entity equals new message source identity new message identity claims equals new list of claims and also var source claim equals new message claim uh, type equals foo and value equals bar um, source identity dot claims dot add source claim source dot identities dot add source identity and we can say var bytes is a message pack serializer NuGet packages are not transitive in .NET Core, are they? Uh, so message pack, and we want so the versions of message pack higher than two don't work with um, .NET 4.5. So we use 1.9.11 for this. Um, which brings in all those bits of code there. And then we can go back to here and we can say serializer dot serialize um, source. And then we can say var actual equals message pack serializer dot deserialize message principle bytes. And then we can say assert dot equal one and actual dot identities zero dot claims dot count and I'm getting a warning here from thing do not use assert dot equal to check for collection size. Control comma to show potential fixes. Nope. Show potential fixes. Use assert dot single. Oh, there we go. That'll do. So if it's that easy then we can do it on identities first, and then we can do it on claims. So let's run this and see what happens. Um, just going to dock this down here. Okay, so, so that has serialized that across. And so we will say um, assert dot equal foo actual dot identity zero dot claims zero dot type Just run that again. Nope, that does appear to be working. So obviously it's just some artifact of the way that the browser shows me what was in the message pack thing. Maybe it's got a, a zero byte in there or something that's um, stopping it from working properly. Uh, okay, so this is good. We now have a serializable version of claims principle that we can pass across to our um, facade application. So the next thing to do is to get this into our facade application. And um, I think we need to write our own authentication provider for it. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna do. Um, 
So let's just, I'm just going to go back to my uh, message. Where's my API handler here? Um, so that's my message principle. That can go into its own file and be nice and neat and tidy. And then we can go back to here. And if we set a breakpoint here, that's fine like that. And I'm going to log this in. So we go to log in here and we do admin and the super secure password. And then we can go to slash facade auth. And if we go to our context, here, um, and our request, and if we look at cookies, we've got an ASP.NET application cookie, a session ID, and an anti-XSRF token. So I'm guessing this application cookie is the one that we're going to want to look at. Um, so I we'll want to be passing that across from our other application. Uh, the other way to look at this, of course, is to use the developer tools in Chrome. And I can drag that down here and then we can go into the application and look at the cookies here and we can see, so we've got this dot ASP.NET dot application cookie, which is set to this big long value here. So however it's doing authentication, um, this looks like what it's actually using to do that authentication. So what I need in the same way as with our facade provider, um, facade session provider. So here's our facade session that we wrote the other day, and this is an injectable class. I haven't tried to make this, the session compatible with the actual session in ASP.NET Core because it's very different. Um, so in .NET and in ASP.NET Web Forms and ASP.NET MVC5 and, and all the old ASP.NET uh, session, you could put anything into session. You could put an int in there, you could put a string in there, you could put a claims principle in there if you wanted to. And beneath the covers in session, it had all this stuff about how can you serialize that and can it be persisted to database. And um, I see a lot of web forms applications that are basically uh, either stuck to running only on one server or that have to use sticky session routing um, at the load balancer layer because the things they're putting into their session cannot be serialized. Um, and so they're stuck using in proc where it's basically it's just got a chunk of memory um with with keys in it for each user and uh that's that's where everything is stored um and a lot of web forms applications in particular work like this um and a lot of it is an artifact of the fact that uh, web forms was trying to hide the fact that you're creating a, a web application and so you didn't think about cookies and you didn't think about urls and query strings and url parameters and all this sort of stuff um you you were pretending that you were writing a windows forms application and so if you needed a variable um but the variable had to be specific to the current user then you just stuck something in session and that's just the way people built stuff so anyway uh, we have our session provider here, and this gets injected, and and the thing, ASP.NET Core session, um, by contrast, only allows you to serialize bytes. So you go, here are some bytes to put into session, and I give me the bytes back from session. So you take care of how you're serializing the values, and obviously you can put extension methods over it to to take care of that and serialize things using bit converter, and UTF-8 encoding for strings and you know message pack or whatever if you want to put complex object graphs in there um but for uh 
for the authentication side of things, I think I actually want to hook in to authentication and, and create my own authentication handler that essentially just proxies through to the back end. Um, so yeah, you, oh sorry, you see here we had our cookies uh, try and get value asp.net underscore session ID. So that's the, the default session variable name. Um, and then it passed that through to the API and said, hey, here's the, the session ID. And in the API, that just means that the session on the HTTP context is automatically the right one. So I think we want to be doing the same sort of thing here, but we're going to be passing this .aspnet.application cookie across instead. So how do you create an authentication provider? Um, so ASP.NET Core Authentication and so we have an iAuthentication service. So we're going to create our own iAuthentication service from the look of it. Um, so uh, create iAuthentication service. Creating an A authentication scheme in here we go, Andrew Best. There's a lot of good documentation for how to configure authentication. If you're faced with a not so standard scenario. So uh, default authorization policy, add authorization. ASP and Okay. I'll register. Okay, so here we go. We have a custom iAuthentication service that only does one thing when asked for a chat. So you are implementing iAuthentication service. And then we do it as an add singleton like that. Um, okay, so if we go into uh, so stick it in services alongside the other thing, um, so we will uh, add a class and we'll call it facade authentication. And this is going to implement I authentication service like this. And then we have, um, let's just turn nullability on in here. So we have authenticate async, challenge async, Forbid async, sign in async, sign out async. Good lord, what are we going to do here? Oh, let's stop this running for a start to get rid of those enormous bugs over there. Okay, um, so authenticate async. This looks like where we are going to talk to the other side of things. And one thing we can do for a start is we can go over to Wingtip Toys and we can um, pull out our various objects that we're using to serialize things across. So if I grab that and move this into here. So the ASP.NET Core code is actually using the very latest version of um, message pack, which does obviously work with, with .NET 5.0. Um, so we can bring message identity across as well. Um, like so. 
and that can go into its own class and then we can find message principle like this and uh, we can paste that into here like this as well and yeah message pack is a standard and so the stuff that is serialized by version 1.9.11 of the library can perfectly well be deserialized by version 2. Point whatever it is of the library um, it's the internal implementation that's changed and so the new versions are probably using spans and buffer writers and buffer readers and all that sort of good stuff um, to, to get every ounce of performance out of things. If you're at all interested in writing, um, you know, uh, high performance code um, or, or any of that sort of thing, I, I highly recommend taking a browse through um, the various repositories on here. This is, uh, yeah, there's a message pack, there's a UTF-8 JSON serializer, which is zero allocation, there's zero formatter, which is an infinitely fast deserializer for .NET and .NET Core and Unity. Um, but yeah, there's lots of, you know, this, this guy is, um, or person, is um, very serious about performance and very serious about, about making these things work um, fast and not allocate and everything else, and also extremely active. You can pick up lots of useful stuff from the code in there, is what I am saying. Okay. So... We have our message principle here. So in our um, code here, we're going to say var HTTP client. Let's copy some of this across from facade session. Um, so we'll have our base address here. And that's going to be facade auth. And then um, we're going to have our HTTP client here. And Just grab that entire code there and we can drop that in here so that's our request and then we want to pass across um, what on earth was it it was uh, dot asp net dot ah. let's go back over here and run this again login admin dollar dollar wrd dot aspnet dot application cookie let's rename that to app cookie and change this so we're going to just pass this through there like so I'm going to make this async so we can await things 
and then we've got to return an authenticate result here. So we can say if response dot uh, status code equals equals um, unauthorized. This is where HTTP really winds me up because I think unauthorized is 401. Yeah, it is. And it doesn't mean unauthorized. It actually means unauthenticated. 403 means you're not allowed to do this thing or forbidden. So um, technically 403 should be unauthorized and 401 should be unauthenticated. But hey ho. Um, then we can return a new return authentication result dot fail. Indicates that there was no information returned for this authentication scheme. So, yeah. Um, let's use that for the time being. Um, so if we want to return authenticate result dot success, uh, new authentication ticket. Right. So we pass an authentication ticket, which into which we put our claims principle and our authentication scheme. Um, so uh, I know if we go to cookie authentication handler. So the cookie authentication defaults dot authentication scheme. So I'm going to create a public class facade authentication defaults, which is going to have a public const string. Let's see what is in here. Authentication scheme is cookies. So, authentication scheme equals facade, like so. Oh dear, this is fantastic chaos coding. I am just <laughs> leaping around in the dark and really hoping this will work. Okay. Um, so we got our response there. If this comes back okay, then we're going to say um, message principle equals message pack serializer dot deserialize async. Um, message principle. What can we pass to deserialize async? Um, response dot I'm going to say var stream equals await response dot content dot reader stream async and then we can use that and pass that through to message pack serializer deserialize async from that stream. And then we need to turn this message principle back into a claims principle. So let's go over to here and we will say, um, we probably don't need that on this side, but we'll keep it there for the time being. And we'll say public um, claims principle to claims principle. And 
and new claims principal. And that takes a bunch of identities. So if we go to message identity, and we say um, for each var message identity and identities, um, claims identity, Let's hope you can actually create these things and Microsoft haven't kept everything protected and internal in the very Microsofty sort of way that they sometimes have. So claims identity is a new claims identity and in here we can pass in, um, so we've got uh, message identity dot authentication type and message identity dot uh, name type and message identity dot role claim type and then I guess we want the innumerable of claims in there as well so we can say uh, var message claims equals message identity dot claims dot select C two new claim and this is going to be C dot type C dot value C dot value type C dot issuer C dot original issuer And our identity here we can then pass in our claims here. And so private innumerable claims identity and we can just grab this down here and pop it in here and then we can say yield return and then this can just be get claims identities so then that works like that now this could get more complicated in the future which is why I'm sort of using the um, <clears throat> for each method um, to do this because if we start trying to handle circular references in here for some reason um, if things don't work properly, then we're going to want to have uh, the, the capacity to do that and to sort of have caches of all the identity objects and all the claims objects and mix and match between them um, to, to build our actual claims principle back up again. So I'm keeping this fairly simple like this. Um, but now in my facade authentication, um, I can just, into my authentication ticket, I can pass in message principal dot, uh, oh no, that needs an await. To claims principal, and this is going to be facade authentication defaults dot authentication scheme like so
and then I can get rid of the rest of this code here. Now, challenge async. Um, forbid async. Sign in async and sign out async. There are two ways to figure out what you're doing with these um, types of uh, services and when you're um, implementing things. And so the easiest way I always find is to go, let's go to the simplest one that we know, know of. Cookie Authentication Handler, which implements Sign-In Authentication Handler. Which for some reason... It's not going to work as well as I thought it would. Right, so um, let's go over to here. So we've got authenticate async. Challenge the specified authentication scheme. An authentication challenge can be issued when an unauthenticated user requests an endpoint that requires authentication. Fine, so but what is it supposed to do? Um, let's see if we can find implementations of this. So we have the built-in authentication service. And authenticate async. Forbid async. So get the thing there and do that. Forbid the specified authentication scheme. Sign a principal in for the specified authentication scheme. I don't think we particularly need to worry about that. Sign out handler dot sign out async is the I authentication sign out handler which goes to here and does context.signout async. Um, do we have a forward sign out? Is there anything? So the handle sign out async there. Appears to just clear cookies and do things like that. Let's just worry about this when we get to it. I think probably for the time being. Um, we can just stick with what we've got here. So if we close other tabs there, <coughs> um, and I'm just going to return task dot completed task. from these for the time being. And we'll worry about what they're actually supposed to do later on. So in theory, if I now go back to my startup class here and I say um, services.add Authentication. No, services dot add singleton, wasn't it? Um, I authentication service uh, facade authentication, like so. And then down here, we say app dot use authentication. Is that the right way round? Um, Uh, 
I cannot remember. Bonus points to anyone who can remind me whether it's use authentication, use authorization, or the other way around. Um, wake up and code. Thank you, Shahid C, for this. Um, so we've got use authentication, use authorization, and what I do remember is that they have to go between routing and startup. So we have our code here. Um, and if we go into facade authentication and we can set um, a breakpoint here. Wingtip Toys is running, so let's just go ahead. What's Wingtip Toys? Have we got any breakpoints in our auth API handler? So let's do debug. Delete all breakpoints. Yes. You carry on running. And I will run my front end here. And uh, I have got a data is null. This method or property cannot be called on null values. OK, that's fine. Why has that happened all of a sudden? For each category in db context dot categories. That's interesting. Have I just suddenly stopped that from working? In so oh no, here we go. So this is. Uh, Something bad has happened here. While well, iterating, data is null. This method or property So I've broken something else. Um, let's go back to my startup class here. And let's take use authentication out. Save and run. And somehow, hey rum dude, hi, thanks for the follow. Much appreciated. Um, nope, okay, I've balked my code here. How have I balked my code here? Why is that suddenly happening? Um, so this is happening in our home view, in our index view. Um, except it's not, it's happening in our layout. And it's happening where we've got our document category things here. Um, so let's go back to here and we'll refresh this. And now we have a debug. Data is null. This method or property cannot be. Um, so db context. And we've got categories, cart items, results. No, so that works. Categories, results is coming back with a SQL null value exception. And I don't know why. And it was working perfectly well like five seconds ago. Um, all right, you stop. And you stop. 
and then we'll go back to Wingtip Toys and we'll start you up again. And then we will go back into here and we will edit our configurations and we will use What have we got? Chrome default browser. So we'll run this. Document dot categories results. No, okay. Does anybody have any idea at all why I am suddenly getting a SQL null value exception? <sighs> Let's go over to here. SQL null value exception. When the value property of a system.data.sql type structure is set to null. Uh, they haven't changed something to the working code nor to the database. Uh, yep, yeah, this sounds like me. I haven't changed anything and it suddenly stopped working. Your EF model likely doesn't match what's in the database. I wonder if it's because I just turned nullability on in this project. Is that possible? That would be really weird. Let's try turning that back again. Um, so we can edit. You go away. And then we can do a complete... We'll do a... Um, advanced build actions, rebuild selected project, stop and build. Yeah, don't worry about that. And then we will... Um, document.categories result. Oh my goodness! Um, today I learned that if you have nullable um, enabled as a compiler option that can break your entity framework code gen or something? I don't know. Um, So let's just stop this. And if I go over to my dbcontext.categories and I've got my category here. Um, and we've got a category name and products. And so if I go over to here, here's my database stuff that's happening over here. Wingtip toys, tables. Uh, categories, um, so do these show up in properties? Category ID, column, nullable, false, category name, nullable, false, description, nullable, true. Okay, so description could potentially be null, and then in products, we've got Product name can't be null, description can't be null, image path can be null, unit path and category ID are integers. So if I go, sorry, I've got completely sidetracked, but I desperately want to know whether this is um, 
liable to work or not. So let's enable nullable annotations and warnings in project again. Um, that's where, so we can use this. This is a really weird syntax, um, but if you have a property that you know is going to be set by the serializer um, and you want to stop the .NET compiler, the C-sharp compiler, from complaining about it being null, then you can say equals null exclamation mark afterwards and it makes it shut up about it. So product and here we can say equals null and we can do the same thing for description and we can do the same thing for category and then down here we can say string image path might be null. Okay, let's see if this works now. So now I've got nullability turned back on in my project file and I've actually set the necessary things to null in here. So my db set of categories and yeah, okay, it works now. How utterly weird and probably good, I don't know. Um, but yeah, very weird that adding nullable enable to your csproj file can suddenly break your database queries. Um, especially because the way I tend to add nullable enable to my csproj files is by pressing alt enter in something with JetBrains installed in it. Okay, um, on that bombshell, <laughs> uh, it's half past eight and I have um, family obligations and commitments and things. So uh, I'm gonna draw a line under this for today and I will be back on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. UK time, uh, which is currently also UTC. Um, so yeah drop back in and we will be continuing to build out this authentication service and uh, trying to get the front end to authenticate and then probably move that admin page and re-implement that admin page as a modern kind of we'll do something interesting with it um, and make sure that you can only get to it if you are logged in as admin. So that should be fun. Uh, thanks for dropping in. Thanks for all the people who followed. Thank you for the feedback, Rum Dude. I really appreciate it. It's it's uh, nice to know that people are, are enjoying this. Um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter. If you have stuff you want to see on the stream or uh, things you want to ask or anything, then you can either ask in the chat here or you can reach out to me on Twitter and I will happily talk about stuff. Um, let me know. And uh, I will hopefully see you again on Thursday. Cheers, everybody. Take care.